Thank you for joining us tonight for After Dark Online Recollections. My name is Kathleen McGuire, and I'm part of the team that puts together these weekly After Dark Online programs. While tonight's program has been recorded remotely, I would like to acknowledge that the home of After Dark, the Exploratorium at Pier 15 in San Francisco, is located on unceded territory, traditionally belonging to the Ramatush Ohlone people, and pay my respect to elders past, present, and future for their stewardship of the land. Throughout our programs in February, we honored Black History Month by sharing underrepresented histories from Black communities, as well as cutting edge work from Black scientists, historians, artists, and community leaders. In tonight's program, we're featuring the stories of two people who, driven by personal passions and professional expertise, built collections of materials over the course of their lives. Charles Teeny Harris was the predominant, preeminent photographer for the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the nation's prominent black newspapers, photographing Pittsburgh historic African-American community from 1935 to 1975. And Marion Stokes, who over 30 years recorded the news 24 hours a day amassing a collection of over 70,000 videos. The collections they built are extremely different with each offering unique lenses on history. However, the two are tied by how deeply personal and intimate their collections are. And for the remarkable value they offer those of us who interact with them in the present day to frame and reframe the way we look at the past. Later, poet, educator and press founder Jalen Harris will join us to share the story of Marion Stokes. This conversation is based on a recent essay Jalen wrote for the first issue of the new journal Black Archives. In this conversation, Jalen shares a bit about Marion Stokes and her archival work, as well as her personal complexities. Jalen also touches on the broader importance of Marion Stokes' work and questions around how history is written and who writes it, and how those questions drove Marion in her own process. Up first, we'll learn the beautiful story of Charles Teeny Harris and the community rooted work being done at the Carnegie Museum of Art in Pittsburgh to research the collection, make it widely accessible, and to celebrate the deep importance of Teeny's photography. And we are so lucky to be hearing that story from Charlene Fogey Barnett, who is the community archivist for the Charles Teeny Harris Photo Archive. Working with the collection's approximate 80,000 images, she helps identify photos, interacts nationally with the African American community to collect IDs, and records oral histories that result in exhibitions, outreach events, lectures like this one, blogs, and tours that she organized. And not only employed by the Teeny Archive, she personally knew Teeny and was photographed by him from infancy through her late 20s. Among other accolades, she was recently named one of 50 Women of Excellence by the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper and one of 100 Pennsylvania African American Women of Influence from Talk Magazine. So I'm very pleased to pass this off to Charlene. I'd like to welcome you to the Charles Teeny Harris presentation. I'm excited to share this beautiful archive of, of extraordinary imagery of African Americans in the 20th century and uh, kind of explain some interesting stories that have come along the way with the archive. So let's get started. 
I call this the teeniest archive uh, as a play on words, but there are over 70,000, if not close to 80,000 negative images um, of Pittsburgh's finest photos, films, and oral histories that Teeny Harris took. Um, so it's a very lush, teeny tiny archive. So hang on, it's going to be a lot. <laughs> I'm Charlene Fogey Barnett. As you know, I'm a community archivist. And I want to point out that I've known Teeny Harris, or I had known him since birth, practically. The picture uh, on your left is me as a baby that Teeny Harris photographed. I happen to have known him because my parents uh, grew up with him. And also, my dad was a civil rights leader and a minister in the city of Pittsburgh. So we saw Teeny uh, very often both socially and for uh, community events and whatnot. This is our archivist, Dominique Lester. Um, she's been with us for five years and she brings a very fresh and unique attitude to the archive. She's helped us reach audiences uh, of a younger age and to make the relevance of this information pertinent to a wide variety of people. And this is Teeny. He's just awesome. This is a little um, younger than I remember him, but he, he, it just looks so much like him and he was such a handsome gentleman. Um, so this is a self portrait he took of himself. But this is how he started. This is teeny little lover with his first camera. And um, actually his grandfather was also a photographer and that was one of his photo uh, photography uh, cameras, excuse me, uh, we believe. But Teeny got the nickname Teeny Little Lover because he threw his arms around an older relative and gave her a big hug. And she said, oh, you're a teeny little lover. And it kind of stuck as a nickname. But um, Teeny was actually a diminutive man when he grew to be older, and so it's, it fit perfectly. And here he is as a teenager on the left, and on the right, he's with his older brother, Woogie Harris. Um, Woogie was really William Harris, and uh, Woogie was someone who was an important person in the community here. He was actually a numbers baron, which is a long explanation, but it, um, the numbers were very important to the banking system of the African American uh, communities when we couldn't go to a regular bank to get a loan for an education or a car, or home, whatever. Um, and so Teeny um, actually asked Woogie to help him put together the equipment that he would need to be a photographer, and Woogie was glad to do that. But Teeny was such a debonair man of style. And these are, again, self-portraits inside his own studio, um, which he had. Uh, the studio was on Center Avenue in the heart of the Hill District of Pittsburgh, PA. And um, we always tease and say that Teeny was the originator of the selfie because he took so many um, pictures of himself. But he was learning quite a bit uh, how to work with the types of, of film he had and remembering that film at that time uh, was not designed for African-American skin tones. So Teeny had to um, jostle around and figure out how he would make these tones as bright and as clear as possible. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, he had a modest home, a home not, not unlike many of our homes. I had a home like this myself. And, um, but what is fascinating to me is that this is his basement slash dark room. Uh, he kept his studio just for about five or six years and then he sublet it. But uh, he thought he was never seeing his family because he was always taking photos or he was down at the studio. So he brought everything home. And, and if you look at this photo in the background, you can see the actual um, solution pans and you can see an enlarger. And to the left, uh, center left, you can kind of see some of the boxes and uh, sleeves and things that he kept the negatives in amid all this usual stuff that's found in a, in a basement. <laughs> um, so it's just fascinating that such a rich archive came from this uh, kind of uh, developing area. And I love to tell that 
to students to, to say, you know, you don't have to have the fanciest equipment to become very successful. Initially, he shot for Flash Magazine, which was a weekly news picture magazine. And here on one side, you see a woman actually holding Flash Magazine. But his uh, prowess came when he became the preeminent photographer for the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper. The Pittsburgh Courier, which you can see is still in existence today, uh, was the number one African-American newspaper for a number of years. And um, so Tini became what is known as their anchor photographer. And um, he was beloved by the whole community. Um, and <laughs> here we go. Tini also had another nickname. His nickname was One Shot Harris. And as you see, the gentleman here is Mayor David Lawrence, who became um, our Governor Lawrence. And because Tini was able to get in and get out and get the shot that, that was pristine uh, without a lot of fuss and rearranging and without um, taking up the mayor's time, the mayor nickname, nicknamed him One Shot. And um, I'm very proud of this photo because those are my parents standing there and the mayor's um, uh, swearing in my father when he became president of the housing authority as one of his community activities. So um, it's, just, it's just so wonderful to have so many of our personal family photos embedded in the images. Um, but this young man, we don't know who he is but this is a prime example of um, Teeny's photography of adorable children. And in the moment photography, he had um, taken this in the K-Boys Club in the Hill District, which was kind of like a, like the Boys and Girls Club. And, um, but um, the little tears streaming down his face always pulls people. And the fact that his, <laughs> gloves, even though in the foreground, um, they still look like they're larger than his head. And uh, it's just a beautiful shot that people request so often. Um, and I would love to know who he is. And he's, he's one of my top 10 favorite photos. And then we have these beautiful, beautiful ladies eating these delicious looking candy apples in front of uh, a local high school in the Hill, Hill District. And um, again, we don't know exactly who they are, but it's just such a happy, joyous photo. And Tini shot every one. Um, these are his neighbors actually, when he was a young man and Tini ended up moving from the Hill District as a, a, a youngster and as an adult man, he lived in Homewood in Pittsburgh, PA. And these were his neighbors, um, which proves that the city was actually more hom homogenous in terms of the racial divide than often uh, it's touted to have been. And then he shot everything. So as you're looking at these, you're gonna notice that Teeny is also shooting a wide variety of photos. Um, he's not just one type of photographer and that's because he was a working man. He did not have the luxury of saying, I'm only going to be a studio photographer or a wedding photographer or a political photographer. He shot everything. And some of his most beautiful work like this one are just shots that he particularly liked and they've been found in the archive. And then of course, these kinds of images where you feel like you're actually in the moment because look at what's happening. Um, we see the young man on the left crossing in front of these children. And it, I'm sure it was just, you know, he took off and some photographers might stop that, but Teeny lets that stay in and you just feel like you're, you're getting soaked with these kids, but enjoying every moment of it. Um, this is from the YMCA, another very key point of the Pittsburgh Hill District where African-American culture uh, breathed and lived, enjoyed, um, played sports, uh, had balls and parties and just was a center of function for us. And this is a great shot of the boxing team. And then the city views, uh, beautiful, beautiful imagery. This one is requested by film offices across the country for use uh, with, um, with television and feature films cars. 
Teeny loved cars. He loved a good car. The one on the left is his car. And most of those were hand-me-downs from his big brother, Woogie. Um, and Teeny was known to have the cleanest car in Pittsburgh. But the one on the right is so interesting because as you can see, it's just a line of these huge cars from that era and one trunk open. And, you know, Teeny was probably on his way somewhere else and just saw this and, and took the shot. As someone who knew Teeny, I can honestly say I never saw him without a camera. And I saw him, you know, with at family functions of his family and my family or whatever. And he was never without his camera. Um, but these great landscape shots and, and uh, kind of pictorial uh, imagery of Pittsburgh, PA, back when we had foggy skies and um, the still mills were filling the air with this dark smog. Um, he does a wonderful job with that. And then, um, of course, I can relate to this era. This is more like the early 60s era um, when I was a little girl and I can remember um, pictures like this, people like this. And um, I feel like I'm standing on the street waiting for these cars to come down. And this one is very interesting and uh, was quite a learning process for me when I came to work with the archive. Um, this is a photo of our of what was the pool at our local amusement park, Kennywood Park. And um, as you can see, Teeny standing very close to the fence, closest uh, <laughs> to these outer ring of cars. And you wonder, well, why didn't he just take the camera and, you know, kind of put it over the fence and kind of, you know, make a better shot of what he was actually taking. But this is what we deem a silent social commentary because what Teeny was actually probably letting us know subtly if you knew the history of this pool and Pittsburgh and what was going on, uh, this pool was segregated. And so essentially he's saying that I'm not allowed in here. And um, there is another barrier there. This fence is an actual uh, racial divide. And I can also attest to that. I grew up in going to Kennywood Park and I had never been in the pool and then they closed once they did desegregate it. Negro League teams. Teeny himself was a Negro League player. He played for the Pittsburgh Crawfords. He was a founder of the Crawfords. And so he um, had an angle with the various teams that other people didn't because he knew these guys. And so a lot of the uh, sports fans like to access our photos of Negro Leagues and National League figures as well. And we know this is Jackie Robinson and um, just a great shot of him leaning on this bat in Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, PA. Musicians and celebrities, uh, I don't know who he didn't take. This is just a very small percentage of people. Um, we have Nina Simone and Satchmo and um, <clears throat> Duke Ellington. And um, let's see, we have, um, uh, my mind just blanked, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, Ella Fitzgerald, that's who it is. Someone my mom would say, you know her. Um, but, um, and entertainers like Lena Horn. And Lena was a native Pittsburgher of sorts. She was brought here by her father in, in her early teens. And she actually grew up with my mom and her sisters. My mom's sisters to the left of Billy Eckstein's arm um, in the lower photo, um, standing behind his, his shoulder. And this party was given by Eckstein for Lena to send her off on her first national tour. And so um, they invited all her friends, but Teeny knew Lena and her father very well. So he had a great opportunity to get in with um, photos that other people couldn't get. Um, and of course, uh, we've talked to Harry Belafonte in recent years about his meeting Teeny here. And we have James Earl Jones and Sammy, Sammy Davis Jr. And then we also have unique photos like this. Um, Teeny would get assignments from the Courier newspaper offices and he might be on his way to something else or you know he might see a fire and stop by. But think about the fact that he's taking this from above. He's taking this from the top of some building or a window looking down on this horrible fire that happened at the Flamingo skating rink. But Actually, it's a beautiful 
um, composition because of the hoses and the trucks and you know everything that you see. It's just a it's a beautiful, however tragic, shot, uh, photograph. And then there are the kids. Of course, you've already seen Little Boy Boxer, but um, these kids just are some of our key photos. Actually, the little girl with the cake is me for my first birthday. And I love the nurse and the doctor. I, I would love to know if they became medical professionals <laughs> in later life. And the little gentleman with the bat is one of Tini's grandsons. And the lovely ladies. Um, these are studio shots that Tini took of these ladies. And as we're watching, um, not only the beauty and the variety that Tini shot, but are you also noticing that, um, let me go back one, that he, he also shot a variety of skin tones as I was talking about earlier. And he, um, he himself told us and then his children told us that he would take his hands in the solutions as some of the photos were being developed. And if he had people of different skin tones, he might put his bare fingers over some of their faces and let the other parts develop up and then after a while lift so the rest of the development would occur. And what that did was allow each person, no matter what their complexion, to have their ears seen clearly or the shine on their hair or um, the, the bracelet on their arm so that they wouldn't either fade out or muddy out. Um, and that was something that he did that I think the black community truly appreciates because of how he kept uh, the dignity of these photos so wonderful for all of us, not just a certain uh, tone and complexion of us. However, this is how Teeny stored his thousands of negatives. Um, Teeny um, had dropped out of school in what was then called junior high. And so he had a very rudimentary way of keeping his information. As you can see, a lot of these boxes will say courier 1951 or 52. And Teeny knew what he had in those boxes, but other people trying to retrieve them might not be able to figure it out. And so when we did receive the collection after this happened, when many of his negatives were found in an unfavorable condition by a friend who had tried to help him and had taken all of the negatives out of their sleeves and actually you know, mixed them up. They were sorting them, but it got mixed up. And some of the degradation of the film occurred because of the, of the way they were kept. Some moisture was down in the bottom of this basement and whatnot. So we had to start again. And a lot of that was with the aid of Teeny's family. And um, the collection was legally brought to Carnegie and um, we looked at what every, everything that they had and what they had um, wanted to, to give us. And then we had to start cataloging. So we had to re-sleeve and rehouse each and every one of these negatives and put them in some collectible, some retrievable order. <clears throat> so as you can see on the left, this is a title for one negative and it's very long and it's very descriptive because the information is complete because we found this information in the Pittsburgh Courier archives when we paired the picture with an article. Combing through nearly 80,000 images in that manner takes a very long time and it's been going on close to 20 years. And of course, we're now keeping the negatives in, um, in good condition uh, physically and under proper storage conditions in cold storage. We also have a paper negative <laughs> for each digital file that we have uh, put together. We, um, we use EMU or EMU, uh, depending on where you are and how you pronounce it. And um, of course, that's all our digital platform information, but each photo has a paper file because there's other information that goes with them that can't necessarily be added into um, a digital file. So um, some of that is something like this. We scour the, the Pittsburgh Courier or other local newspapers, and we put the article, the image, and whatever we can find that goes with each photo. Another most important part of our work is the oral histories. 
and I'm going to be playing one for you soon, but um, we could not figure out what else we're looking at, even if we had some information from a newspaper, but most often we don't have information. So we've had to ask people who are part of a club or part of a church or who were members of a certain sorority or fraternity or whatnot, who are these people? Is that you? What are you doing? Um, why was Teeny there? That kind of thing. And um, this is a lot of fun though, because we also get to work closely with the Harris family and we get to hear some incredible stories. And I'm gonna insert one here um, and hope that you can hear it. Let me turn it up a little bit. And this is someone who worked with Teeny as a junior editor at the Courier newspaper. In many instances, a reporter would send Teeny out and myself as junior editor to cover a particular event. And we would sort of write and get ready for the picture coming in. But then when we'd see the picture, the picture would write the story because Teeny was just that good. He was perceptive. He would get on a scene and within seconds, he would understand what was happening. He would uh, see where the lighting was the best to get that person. He would catch their personality. He was intuitive enough to understand that this person thought they were a big shot or that this person was a very gentle person or that this person had uh, a shy side. He was very perceptive. And when he would come back with those pictures, you know, all of us, as, as, as at the time that I was writing when I wasn't working for advertising, I would look at those pictures and say, wow, this is a whole different story. And so you'd think that the reporters wrote the stories, but a lot of times T's picture wrote the story. That's one of our favorite uh, oral history collections. Um, and we use it quite a bit because it really talks about Teeny with the same kind of energy Teeny had. Um, I'm wondering if you could guess who this shot is because a lot of what Teeny did was to share um, photos of people as they were becoming major celebrities or stars or whatever. And if you don't know it, this is George Benson, the famous guitarist when he was a, a preteen actually playing here in the Hill District, um, probably in the Y. This is um, a legislator, very famous Pennsylvania legislator. It's Kay Leroy Irvis, who was known as the Lion of uh, Harrisburg and one of the first black speakers uh, of any state. But this is his off time and he is actually, um, this is his hobby. And there's a, uh, there are a lot of photos of him with aviation and other um, books and, and you know, biopics of him. But uh, this is Leroy when he was teaching my neighbors. These guys were the people that lived on my street and my brother's standing on the right. Um, and he took these kids and not only taught them how to build these planes, but how to fly these planes and took them to flying fields. So it's just amazing what he um, photographed. Um, these are firemen. Um, and in almost all these photos that you're seeing, you're seeing my father-in-law's in this one, he's the third one from the front, but I wanted you to see that um, my proximity was with Teeny was very close and very often. Um, this is my cousin's wedding at Holy Cross Church and it was probably 1963 and I'm the little flower girl. And um, so when I say I know how Teeny would come in and, and get things arranged and whatnot, it was very fast and very furious. But one of my jobs was to tell people, Teeny's here, Teeny's here, hurry up. He's not gonna be here, but for a minute. And um, when I came to the museum as a volunteer to tell my oral histories and my stories, I was sharing this information with them and they were delighted that they could talk to someone who really knew how Teeny was. This is an important set of photos because this is what the destruction of the Lower Hill District of Pittsburgh looked like. It's a very sad uh, photo on the left um, as they built this structure on the right. But what that, that did was displace the Lower Hill District residents and to split our community so that families and businesses that were right down the street from each other were now uh, moved out to different areas. But here we have, uh, once the building was built, um, 
some of the ecumenical community and A. Philip Randolph who's standing in the middle and my dad who was a, a bishop at the time is standing third from the right. They, they tried to come together with uh, the priests and um, rabbis and whatnot to, to try to restructure the ut utilization of this building. Tini did everything, all these beautiful shots. Um, the fireman is just impressive to me. And it goes on and on as he cheers us on. <laughs> but we produce beautiful exhibitions from all of these, uh, these great negatives. And because we work off the negative itself and not from uh, any other source or resource, um, we can get a nice true image. And we've been using uh, for a number of years after one of our biggest retrospective shows in 2011, 2012, we were given the ramp space to um, what that's what we call uh, the lobby gallery in the Carnegie to use themed um, exhibitions. One was on hair, one was on elections, some were on cars, some were on civil rights, um, some were on the oral histories. And then we have external exhibitions that we've done at the August Wilson Center in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, beautiful shots there. And then we've done some very nice work abroad. Um, in Newcastle, England, we've uh, done one about oral history collections in Pittsburgh called Not As It Is Written, Black Pittsburgh in Voice and Image. Uh, I had the privilege of going over and uh, speaking on this. And guest curators, we always include a guest curator with our shows so that we can ask questions of someone like myself who has some close, uh, relationship with a topic. Uh, of course, that's Michael Keaton right there in the top middle, uh, native Pittsburgh guy. And when he came home one year to see teeny photos, we grabbed him and said, hey, would you like to do an exhibition with us? Um, <clears throat> we have um, Sean Gibson with the gray shirt on who is part of the representation of the Josh Gibson Foundation. We have Bradford Young, who's a filmmaker. And um, we even have a gentleman in the lower left with the blue jacket who was a, whose father had a gas station in the Hill District and he was one of his workers, but he eventually became the, um, uh, the uh, Gulf oil executive in the area. And so he could talk to us from soup to nuts about cars and uh, uh, the automotive industry and whatnot. And so we try to get a variety of people so that we can reach a variety of uh, patrons. And we've done a lot of outreach, which is my primary job to go out and make certain that people know about Teeny and know how um, much they can use him. Education is a key part of what we do as well. And whether it's for high schools or colleges or even adult education, we continue the process. But we also have some very cool special opportunities if you'll notice, this is the Carnegie Science Center, which is one of our sister uh, museums in the Carnegie system. But on the left, you see a little a building um, and that's a, a trainscape building as you can see on the right. And um, this curator asked us to uh, come and talk about what the Crawford Grill, a very famous uh, institution here in Pittsburgh for jazz and jazz musicians beginning. Um, they wanted to put the building in. But if you look, you'll see on the left, a little teeny tiny man in the street with a camera. And that's a teeny tiny teeny <laughs> depicted taking photos of the Crawford Grill. <clears throat> and there are thousands of his photos of the grill, uh, mostly internally, of, of course, um, that we have in the archive. We've worked with Pittsburgh Opera for uh, an actual opera on Josh Gibson that had uh, nothing but imagery from Teeny Harris as their set design and various other um, uh, plays and opportunities. We've had Common come and talk about how much he loves Teeny. And we work with film companies. Uh, when Fences, uh, August Wilson's Fences came to Pittsburgh, it was a real joy to work with their uh, set designs and their um, uh, makeup and costuming to uh, make it look like 1957 Hill District. And um, it was a real cool moment for me because it was um, August Wilson's 
play made into a film, but they couldn't flesh it out without Teeny Harris imagery. August is from the Hill District, Teeny's from the Hill District, I'm from the Hill District, and I felt like I was able to help bring the voice of these great people that came out of my hometown together. So they built um, in, in the set, they built the Pittsburgh Courier offices, and that's Teeny's family holding the clapboard. And they also, as an homage to Teeny, they built a Harris studio, which was not originally in the script, to thank him for all the imagery that he, um, that he offered for them to do the films. And we're working with subsequent, the uh, Ma Rainey and the subsequent films of August Wilson's plays that Paramount is doing. And then we have an inordinate amount of um, Tuskegee Airmen in the Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania area. And so we have had photos, the teeny shot of them and uh, their exhibitions in our, in our airport and various parts around the city. And we're also proud to say that Teeny is featured in the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, DC. And he has his own kiosk and one of his cameras is in it. And a lot of his photography is around the building as well. But what we're very excited about to share is the fact that we are now back to a dedicated Teeny space in the Scaife Galleries at the Carnegie Museum of Art. And um, as you can see, when you look through the gallery, you can see Teeny looking at you. And when you get there, you get to take a beautiful shot standing next to this guy. Um, we wanted to not just put photos in the gallery and just have any old you know, kind of subject up, but we wanted to pinnacle what Teeny was about. And so we called the exhibition In Sharp Focus. And um, we kind of took off from a very broad and wonderful quote by the historian, Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., who often says this sentiment, that if there are 42 million African-Americans, then there are 42 million ways to be black. And that is exactly what Teeny has done. Teeny is the proof of our community. Um, we know about um, slavery, um, the Reformation period, Jim Crow, civil rights, black nationalism, the Obama era, and now Black Lives Matter. But the majority of what is what ties all of that together is the middle ground, the middle space of what was actually happening in our communities. And those are not stories that are often told because they don't seem as sensational or as impactful, but they are the connective fiber and they are proof of who and how we live. Um, so we broke this, this theme down into three separate categories to start the conversation. One was access and opportunity, one was multifaceted identities, and one was social networks. And um, so we are using those as we can tour um, intermittently um, amid COVID in the gallery and also on digital platforms. And this is what the gallery looks like. We have beautiful seating. We have um, our beautiful, what we call teeny blue walls because the blue tone, that very pale blue makes these black and white photos pop. And um, it just has always worked. So we were excited to, to do this again. And as you can see, um, actually these two women are photographers and uh, videographers in their own right here in the city of Pittsburgh. And they knew Teeny, one of them knew Teeny. And so they're just you know, studying his work. And we have a replica of his, not only one of his speed graphic cameras, which is the one he used the most. He used it far after, long after other um, press photographers stopped using a great big camera like that because he loved the product he got. He loved the negative that he got. Um, and so you can see some negative prototypes and whatnot. And we also had innovative technology. We have this touch screen and we can't use it right now because of COVID, but what it does is populate all 80,000 of these images in either a transcendence of the year or from you know, infancy to, to an older age or by tone of the photo or by um, theme um, or by accession number. 
And then we also have the iPads where you can import specific names. You could put in um, anything you're looking for and pull up an image. Uh, and um, you can even add information for us to get back in touch with you to talk about what you um, have found or to ask for an oral history from you or for you to correct uh, uh, a name spelling or a place or you know whatever. So we just love Teeny. We are so proud of him. There's so much more that's going on that we do with Teeny. And um, I just don't have time to keep talking about it. Um, but we love Teeny. We appreciate him. And we uh, are lifting him up so that he becomes, we hope, an international figure of um, incredible photojournalism and his historian and humanitarian aspects. You know, a lot of what he's doing, not just telling our stories, but telling them in such dignified ways. And um, without his keen eye and the confidence of the community, because we all knew him pretty much and we trusted how he would take the shot or utilize the shot, uh, we might not have had this beautiful um, remembrance in our own personal and um, broad black uh, history without Teeny Harris. So we're very, very proud of our Teeny. Thank you so much for that introduction to Teeny and to your work, Charlene. I encourage everyone to head to cmoa.org backslash Teeny and explore this truly amazing collection. Now, we'll be moving on to learn about a very different kind of archive, the one built by Marion Stokes over the course of her life as she recorded the news. I was honored to join J. Lynn Harris in conversation to discuss Marion. J. Lynn is a poet, educator, editor, and press founder from Baltimore, Maryland. She founded Soft Savage Press for the sole purpose of promoting visual and literary works by Black people. She earned her MFA from the University of Baltimore, where she was the inaugural recipient of the Michael F. Klein Fellowship for Social Justice. Her work has been featured in Transition Magazine, Scalawag Magazine, as well as elsewhere. Her first collection of poems, Exit Through the Afro, is available through Soft Savage Press. Jalen and I's conversation is based on a recent essay she wrote for the first issue of the journal Black Archives, which I encourage folks to check out. The essay, titled Recorder Through the Eyes of the Beholder, is a response to a film recently released about Marion Stokes. And in addition to sharing the work Marion did, probes the importance of her archiving, as well as the complex effects it had on her. So here's Jalen. Thank you for joining us, Jalen. Uh, it's really an honor to have you here, and especially after Jalen has been teaching all day. So we're really thrilled to have her with us after a long day of doing that work. Uh, but to get us started, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and in particular your writing and the press that you operate? Yeah. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It is a pleasure to have something that's not grading to do <laughs> right now. Um, so yeah, I'm Jalen and I started this publishing company like two years back called Soft Savage Press. And the very first publication we did, it was called Canary. Um, also a book designer and educator and a poet. And I started Soft Savage Press because I wanted to make Canary, quite frankly, that was the heart of it. And I wanted a place where Black folks, Black queer folks, Black femme-identified folks could have their literary and visual work represented. So I decided on Canary, and the name is after Rita Dove's poem Canary about Billie Holiday one of my favorite poems and my favorite poets. Um, and so, yeah, Canary is a literary survey of Black femme writing from Baltimore to North Carolina, South Africa. There's an interview with the South African erotic writer in the middle of it. Um, so that's that publication. And then 
The second publication we put out was my own chapbook called Exit of the Afro. And I like to describe this book as it's a speculative museum in verse. So on the cover, we have um, Ida B. Wells and Francis E.W. Harper, and they are some of the co-creators of the National Association for Colored Women. And uh, I put them on the cover because they are really the impetus for me even, they were the, the first poem I wrote was a love letter between them. So it's speculative in that, a lot of my work is speculative in that I imagine other futures or histories of real or imagined characters. So historical people who have lived or characters and books that I've read and make it gay. <laughs> Just make it gay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for that, um, sharing that piece of your work. And it's interesting too, because I feel like there is a connection to Marion Stokes who we're going to talk about and her work revealing a history that might've otherwise been lost or a different kind of history. Um, but I guess to get us started, could you tell us a little bit about Marion Stokes and what she did as a collector and an archivist? Yeah, so Marion Stokes was born in 1929 at the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, I think we're all kind of familiar with what it is like to experience our own depression now. I think it's super important to position an understanding of like her life in such a time of scarcity, um, her being born. And so professionally, she was a librarian who was also a socialist who then was recruited by the Communist Party um, to join them. And she wanted to defect from the States. And so her and her, hu her first husband and her son, she had one child, um, they tried to seek asylum in Cuba, but they only got as far as Mexico and had to come back to the States. And not too long after they came back, um, in 1978, the Iranian Revolution began. And in 1979, the 24 hour news cycle started, which even for me to be so young to think like TV used to turn off. <laughs> like there was a time when it began <laughs> that TV didn't stop. So she, she um, was keeping close tabs on the revolution and noticed that in some of the early reports, the news uh, broadcasters had mentioned that they were, along with the American hostages, there were like 444 hostages, that there were some who were uh, CIA agents. But then later on in the reporting, there was no other information about these CIA agents. So she's like, okay, so what's true? What's really happening? And that, sparked, as I mentioned in the essay, a type of hostage, a metaphorical hostage situation between her and her screen, because then for the next 30 years, she taped the news, both locally and nationally, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And she amassed 70,000 tapes. <laughs> so it's like to think about that number. Yeah. I've never had 70,000 anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so later on, after her death, her son took all of the tapes um, and gave them to an archive in San Francisco. And now that they, they're publicly available. So that's a yeah. short long of her legacy. And yeah, 70,000 tapes too is just unbelievable to imagine because physically too, those tapes take up space. Um, yeah. And also just to call attention to uh, that San Francisco institution, the Internet Archive, which is archive.org, um, that just does amazing work of bringing resources together and making them accessible for free. And it sort of feels like an ideal place for this collection to have landed. Um, so I'm curious too, in the essay, one of the first ways you describe Marion is as a freedom fighter. 
So, and you're making a very clear connection, I think, between the political history uh, that she had and continued to have throughout her life, as well as her collection. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what her intention was for that collection um, and what drove her in this consuming obsession as she documented so many different forms of the news. That's a great question. I mean, her intent was to expose the news for the way that news information, which is like positive as fact, is always, <laughs> I think it's safe to say always like fueled by some type of rhetoric or argument or position, right? So um, when she noticed this very first discrepancy between there's this conversation about CIA agents being hostages and then they're not anymore. It's like, okay, so then what is real? And um, there's actually a quote that she says that um, on, she used to co-host the show Input with her second husband, who, the man who became her second husband. It's a talk show. And um, she said, those in power are able to rewrite their own history from their own bias. And that quote is kind of like I, her intention and her vision around taping the news. I think she was trying to uh, insert her own power or reverse power rather, meaning she, by being able to see the news from all sides, all the news outlets and what the information they were pointing and uh, delivering, whoever then got to see the tapes that she had been archiving and collecting could kind of reverse the, the looker who was being seen, is what I'm trying to say. Like the news, a lot of times, the function of the news is to witness someone else or some other situation. And her intent was, if we have all of these um, mirrors <laughs> rather, we can look at the news and decide for ourselves what is true. So in that way, she's kind of revert, she's trying to revert po the power dynamic. Right. Um, and you, you have many really beautifully written quotes and sort of concepts that appear in this essay. Uh, and one thing I'm interested in sharing with the audience is this quote um, around uh, how Marion is treated in a documentary that came out around her. And in it, you say, uh, the viewer is encouraged to understand the various forces she was struggling under, the intimate relationship between capitalism and hoarding, the dialectic between her pursuit of freedom and how it tethered her to her work, and the myriad ways Black people react to the traumas of our material realities. So that also makes me curious, how do you think that Marion's identity as a Black woman also played into what drove her to collect and make sure that there are more lenses on history than the most dominant ones. Yeah, I mean, Marion, her identity as a woman, as a black woman, she really understood what it meant to be under gaze and how gaze was how an image of herself was manipulated, could be manipulated rather, by dominant, <laughs> do like just dominant um, voices, you know? So she had been looked at her whole life, just like she had looked at TV, you know? And I think she really wanted to, look and assess for herself and um she enacted that by taping so much and 
yeah, Marion came from her tradition of, she was an activist also, you know, she just, she wasn't just someone who just sat around and taped for 30 years, like before she was doing this big uh, archival work, she was a part of activist, socialist and communist communities where liberation, freedom from capitalism was the primary objective. So that also was born out of a understanding that like she was being held captive in a lot of her, her, her identity was being held captive and decided for herself based on dominant cis, pet, white, male centered dogma, really, honestly, I would say pra praxis, but <laughs> you know, so hegemonic thought, like, so this was her, her way of being able to say, no, I'm looking, I'm seeing you. And when this archive becomes publicly available, then you will be, we will be, we're watching you. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I'm curious too, um, something that comes up quite a bit in your essay is the tension between the clear pursuit she had and a very clear vision she had, but then this other side of it in which like people can very easily call her a hoarder and not recognize that vision. So I'm curious thinking about the overarching um, history of activism and the activist as someone who's often uh, has a personal pursuit as how they're uh, forcing, sorry, can I go back and <laughs> read the question so that I frame it a little bit more succinctly? Okay. Um, so continuing on that thought, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the tension that sort of arises in the essay where it's very clear that Marian had a clear vision for what she wanted uh, of this collection and also what she wanted to create for people to use in the future in order to be able to see history in a broader way and also sort of decide for themselves what the historical record is. And that is an act of personal activism and sort of the other side of that, of people interpreting that as maybe hoarding or as something that wasn't recognized while she was alive. So I guess what I'm trying to get at too is that tension between activism as a sort of personal act to create change, but one that also has a great personal toll to it. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about that duality um, and the complexities of this kind of work. Yeah, I mean, there's def that I'm still sitting with that tension in the essay between, um, and I guess the dialectic that capitalism creates between hoarding and um, freedom. Because to be honest, I was drawn to her story because I, I, a lot of the time see artists who are deeply struggling mentally, who create these beautiful works of art, or in her case, an archivist, when it seems like they're, the, what they're dealing with emotionally, personally, mentally is um, overshadowed or seen as, a necessary means to an end of their work. And watching the film, it's very clear to me that and everyone who's close to her, her caretaker, her son, her ex-husband, or her husband at the time, excuse me, um, she, they all, they, and he, or also his children <laughs> who are also in the film, like they all recognize her as someone who is obsessive compulsive, that, the, that, that she is controlled by this need to collect. And to me, it seems that she's deeply suffering. 
And as someone who is an artist who uses words, poetry, prose as outlet, I, I really relate to that suffering. And I also relate to the suffering being lauded when it produces something valuable. And there's this really intense tension for Marion and her story because, for, because she is a hoarder. She doesn't just collect 70,000 tapes. In the film, we also learn that she's, every time Apple has a product, she has three, four, five, six, seven of them. You know, she's collecting other things. Like it's not just this one thing that she's pursuing, right? And there's also not this clear intention about, there, she has an idea that th this work will exist and live on in some way, but there's no necessary plan for that. And I think it's super important to recognize that her son, Michael, He's the one who makes sure his mother's legacy isn't just the fact that she's suffering under obsessive compulsive need to view, watch, record news. And the folks in her life are also, for lack of a better word, enablers or supporters, whichever one, who who are who make her recording possible. They're the ones who switch the tapes. They're the ones who make sure she's back in time when she's too old to drive, you know what I mean? Like there's a community of people surrounding her who are making sure that her intention, her, her compulsion to collect is possible, you know? And then when she passes that her memory is such that she is an archivist and um, all the 30 years of work that she, done, that she does is not lost. And I think there, I think sitting with the tension between knowing that witnessing in memory from those who have known her that she was suffering in her life because the material controlled her. And that's the thing about capitalism though, you know, like capitalism is the incessant accumulation of material for no, no with no end in sight. <laughs> right <laughs> and for her there was no end in sight the sight ended in death and that's the same thing with capitalism capitalism has to die in order for the material to stop being collected and like you know I think a lot about historical materialism teaching us that material creates ideas instead of the ideas created by material you know and I, I, I really I mean I'm just saying all this because I have that's the tension that I see in the film and it's the it's yeah. just it's the question that I'm still mewling over about okay so what came first <laughs> you know yeah that's yeah that's a lot to ponder and I feel like it also I really like the way you talked about her in relationship to your own experience as an artist and that also sort of makes me think about how um, Marion was a librarian and library science is guided by super strict rules. It has tons of parameters. Um, most collecting institutions have super clear policies and then they're followed to a T. So there's something very interesting that she chose to create this very personal collection that reframed her traditional career um, and almost reclaimed it from those parameters that are prescribed. Um, I guess I'm, we do have, I do have some questions related to that, although I'm not quite sure if we'll go into it. Um, yeah, but I, I guess maybe the question out of that is there are these archives that exist that document the news in that constrained way. Like there's an archive at Vanderbilt that records the 7 p.m. news from the three major stations every single night. Um, and I think the intention of that collection is like, oh, and now you can go back and you can see how the news covered certain things and it does sort of unearth histories. Um, but I'm wondering like, what is the value and what is the power of this collection being Marion's personal vision and it being driven by a person and a person with a very complicated and complex 
background and experience. Yeah, it's the, it's the complexity. It's the complexity. Yeah, I, I I don't mention her to be a hoarder to like to dismiss her archive, but just to create a, a wider view of complexity about you know we we suffer <laughs> as people and we also create great beautiful things and you know so I, for Marion as as a librarian and as an activist and those are things that deeply are inform her archival intention and her vision like it's I guess the rhetoric there the or the argument her as the rhetor is not because it's not it's not attached to corporation or institution it's through the lens of i mean i don't like the word neutrality but i guess liberation from the standpoint of a black woman's eyes her lens her as looker her as um curator as broadcaster as you know as as author and not actor and that's what the news positions those who are not in sight you know like it it, it makes those who the news is about actors while those who tell the news they're authors and 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 marion because she's not attached to institution or corporation she's the author you know and she's she in intent is trying to allow other people authorship. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, we have time for one more question and you, you've touched on this, but I guess I'll just sort of pose it in a very direct way, which is that Marion is dealing with a few different entities that claim neutrality. She's dealing with collecting, she's dealing with archives, and she's dealing with the news. All three of those sort of entities often position themselves as neutral. Do you think neutrality is possible in these kinds of organizations or sort of uh, professions? Yeah, I just don't believe it. I've never seen it. Like, you know, I, and it's, I mean, if nothing for the fact that I, I teach English and I teach the rhetorical triangle. Like, <laughs> like um, the, uh, there's the author, there's what I write, there's what I have uh, channeled, you know, through all the, the ways that words come about. Um, and then there's always, there's the purpose that I, and 10 but then there's audience and there's context and those two things that they the audience all oh, text is living archive is living art is living for a reason because it it's changed based on the time the context and the audience the people right so there's there if nothing there cannot be any neutrality because of that and then the author themselves themselves or themselves we come from, so, I mean, comes from a, a point of view. There is a point of view, whether you're writing in first, second, or third person, right? Like, or if you're filming something, or if you're using a, a source, primary, secondary, tertiary, you know what I mean? Or, so it just, yeah, neutrality cannot exist. And at least I don't believe it can exist. <laughs> and Marion, I think very clearly believed it didn't exist and showed that through this life pursuit. Yeah, and that, yeah, I think that is definitely like uh, a part of her thesis that there's no neutrality. There's not just the news. The news is not just facts. The news is not just information because the news has such a powerful way of shaping our cultural knowledge, our cultural history our collective knowledge, our collective history, Marion was like very much so pushing against that and being like, okay, well, these are, this is the material and these things shape our ideas. And now as authors who can overwhelm view of all the material, for, think for yourself, <laughs> you know, like what is true? <laughs> so. And that, that's such a, 
fantastic sort of thought to end it on, which is think for yourself and think about what is true. Yeah. So thank you so much, Jalen. Um, I really appreciated this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.